Let's open uh, our panel discussion. I'm very pleased to talk to you today about assessment in and, uh, our, and the role of artificial intelligence in assessment. As we are talking about, we have super exciting panel members for today. Um, we already had a similar panel at the last year conference. And we felt that we, at least as the panelists, enjoyed so much that we wanted to repeat it. We're going to talk about quite a different things this year. And I'm also very pleased to have such an amazing group of people that we can talk about uh, these things that are related to assessment. They're all leaders in assessment and also with exceptional way of thinking and using artificial intelligence for assessment and uh, education. Uh, our panel involves uh, Professor Sandra Milligan, who is the Director of the Assessment Research Centre at the University of Melbourne. We have also Dr. Z uh, Zach Swicky, who is a lecturer in Learning Analytics at the Centre for Learning Analytics at Monash University in Australia. We have also Dr. Andrew Kingdon, who is the Chief Psychometrician and Manager uh, responsible for Psychometrics and Analytics at the New South Wales Education Standards Authority based in Sydney, Australia. And we also have Catherine McClellan, who is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer responsible for assessment and psychometric research at the Australian Council for Educational Research. As you can see, we have really very distinguished panel of speakers who have really rich wealth of experience uh, with respect to the creation as well as leadership at large scale of assessments and lots of responsibility for very many innovations as well that are related to assessment and the ways how we can reimagine assessment. We found today that we really want to kind of discuss some more emerging trends that are related to assessment and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Then I thought we could actually start from first uh, referring uh, to Zach, who recently led a really interesting paper uh, that is published in Computers and Education Artificial Intelligence, and the paper is entitled Assessment in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. So Zach, you work with a really uh, large and uh, really exciting team of uh, people who have lots of interesting ideas about assessment. So can you share with us some key findings on how AI can be best utilized to improve and or enhance assessment? Yeah, thank you, Dragon. I'd be happy to do that. Um, also, some of my co-authors are on this talk, so representing their work as well. Um, so from that paper, I think a few of the things we talked about is that um, most of the assessments that we're seeing today are still part of what's been called by uh, called the the standard assessment paradigm. So you have some some predefined set of items, some things like questions or prompts, um, and you use those to infer some claims about um, student proficiency. And so these these are widely used, but they have uh, some well documented problems, and I think we talk about five of them uh, in the paper. So one is that they can be really difficult to design and implement. So it can take a long time and a lot of energy uh, to create them uh, and also to uh, to perhaps mark or score assessments as well. Um, another is that they provide only a snapshot of what students can do at a single point in time. Um, a third is that they often provide the same items or questions or prompts to every student, regardless of their experience or their background. Um, a fourth thing is that they can be inauthentic, so not really representative of the way that people do things in the real world or in real professions <clears throat> or in real work. Um, and the last thing we talked about is that they can really uh, focus on skills that are becoming increasingly obsolete. So things that, um, for example, technology is getting better at doing. Uh, so some of the ways that we talked about in which AI can kind of improve assessments related to those issues is that they can make them easier to develop in a number of ways. So there's uh, AI uh, methods out there for automatically generating questions to, to, to put in assessments. There's also well-known literature on automated uh, assessment or grading of, of, of written work. So things like essay scoring, uh, short answer scoring. Um, also, some people are starting to do some interesting work with these uh, new tools that are developed from like large language models or generative AI, so things like GPT-3. Uh, um, people are use, starting to use those to kind of automatically develop student feedback or ways of, of, ways of giving feedback on, on student work. 
Um, another thing is that uh, AI can kind of make more assessments more continuous in the sense that they give us the, the data capture technology to kind of monitor students over longer periods of time or longer episodes of activity. Um, a third thing that we discussed is they can make uh, assessments more personal. So there's a lot of work in the adaptive testing literature that kind of looks at the current state uh, of the student uh, and adjusts the assessment tasks or questions based on how they've done, how they're doing or how they've done before. Um, another is that they can make uh, assessments a bit more authentic in the sense that they allow us to focus on processes and not just outcomes. So the activities or events that people are doing um, during the assessment. Uh, and uh, just more generally, students can start to use AI to complete their tasks. And I think this is something we're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, but it's becoming more and more a reality. So, um, you know, we've used technologies to do things for a long time, like graphing calculators or, or, or word editors, right? But we're kind of in a new, new age where the technology is actually creating things rather than just checking or helping us do the things. So we can use things like uh, GPT-3 for writing or even coding or, or other things like that. So those are some of the main ways that we um, discussed uh, AI and how it can kind of change or and hopefully improve assessment. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Zach. I mean, I'm sure that we will unpack many of these points as we are going forward. And I thought that uh, we could actually touch down on some of these issues that you uh, discussed about in the paper, which I actually just popped in here in the chat so that everybody can also find it. And I want to direct a question to Sandra. Obviously, Sandra, you have lots of interesting ideas how we can move forward assessment. That is happening in school primarily, but also in higher education. You've done some exciting work on learner profiles. At the same time, also, what is coming up um, in the literature that we found in, uh, uh, in related to the use of AI in assessment is also the notion of continuous assessment. So I just want to basically ask you, how do you think that, and if, first of all, and then if so, how do you think that AI can potentially be helpful to promote the notion of the uh, continuous assessment and potentially overcome some of the limitations of the existing approaches that are typically um, more discrete type of assessments that are happening like just at certain static points in time rather than to happen continuously. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I want to join my question, Dragon, with what Zach said, because I, yes, th please. Um, I think that continuous assessment and continuous teaching or yeah. continuous feedback or continuous, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, AI is going to support all of those things. And um, I, I, I saw it in my heart, I think that educators, oh, hello, we've got a visitor. Um, educators are very slow. Education as an industry is very slow to pick up on these things. I mean, I remember myself, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we were working on all sorts of ways to con to um, improve the continuous feedback in MOOCs, and uh, but very little of that has really gone into the mainstream. Well, it's had a bit of a push forward with COVID, but it, but um, I'm really confident that AI could revolutionise or improve dramatically things like continuous assessment of the sort that we really want to do. But I don't think that's where we need to really look to um, AI because I think that things that when most people think about continuous assessment, they're still thinking in the standard assessment paradigm that Zach talked about, which is where you've got a set body of information or knowledge you want people to, um, to cover you're going to build systems that give continuous feedback about how they're going. And you might do that by having automated item design. You might personalise it a bit. You might make the performance task a bit authentic. But you're still working within the old assessment paradigm, which is trying to find out how much of a set body of knowledge or, or skill or whatever a person has mastered at a particular time and to track them as they go through. I think the work that, that really needs to be focused on now is 
a different assessment paradigm, um, which is not standardised, which is focused on things that machines can't do. Uh, I mean, machines can do most of the things that we're teaching people now, but if we, would, if we were focusing our education on things they can't do, like communication with other humans in areas that have never been done before, sort of creative communication, um, responding to the emotional or cultural or social environment that's new, um, being a critical thinker, um, um, being able to uh, explore premises that have, that have not been explored before. These are the challenges of education. And at the moment, I don't think I'm, I'm seeing anything that AI is, is helping us with for those things. And in fact, here I'll um, venture an opinion, I think AI shouldn't because in a way it's um, getting back to human judgment that is going to be the direction we need to go to first before we um, go through the AI to the AI part of that. So I guess I'd say continuous assessment, yes, if you're in the standard assessment paradigm. We wouldn't want to go there if we're going to the new assessment paradigms that are emerging around the globe today. So there you go. There's, there's an opener anyway. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm sure, Sandra, we will get back to that point as well. I really like that point. And also you raised some of the also good cautionary tales as well that we need to be thinking about as well the extent to which we can um, write some of these issues. Yeah, I, I think, you, sir, uh, Can I just say, I've got this horrible vision of a student who will enter a class, get the assessment, be very skilled at writing the algorithm to get the bot to do the assessment, uh, write the algorithm, get the assessment, look at it briefly, put it into the marking bot and get a, um, get a mark so that you've actually got no human uh, learning going on in the whole automated assessment string. And, you know, that's, I think we've got to try and break that because, um, you, you know, there's no learning happening if that's where we lead to. And I, I think that this is really essential. Uh, in my view, I, I think we really need to make sure that we are still measuring something that is related to human learning rather than that is, and also in particular that we can isolate the types of skills as well that we are interested in learning. Obviously, in, the, in this scenario, you talked about good on the student to, has the, uh, to have the skills to program the bot to help them to do some of these things. And I think that's really an important skill to have in the future as well, but we need to still understand how humans are also developing. And I think this is a nice segue as well to the question I wanted to ask Andrew, um, with whom I actually had a few conversations and he had some really interesting thoughts as well before more recent, um, even broader kind of emphasis on chat GPT, GPT and, the, and the kind of use of and the role of the large language models such as GPT-3 and also everybody's uh, highly anticipated GPT-4 model that is coming and any other similar model in the future that are proving to be capable to write at least quite coherent uh, essays or answers to different types of questions, yet obviously certain um, uh, uh, reliability of these responses can be questioned. So, Andrew, how do you see the role of these type of uh, technologies, AI, that is producing in recent days? They clearly pose certain challenges, and Sandra mentioned one of these challenges to assessment. So how do you see their role, and also how do, you how do you see the strategies that we can take to address some of the questions that are coming up with, with the use of these technologies? Well, I think like uh, many people in the machine learning world, uh, we've spent a great deal of the past few days uh, on the OpenAI website having a look at chat GPT. Um, and if you're in AI and you haven't been doing that, you're probably living on Mars with Elon Musk, although Musk's probably got Starlink and looking at ChatGPT. Um, it's, that's actually really sort of scary stuff. Um, I actually, uh, three years ago, it used to be that large language models could produce uh, some computer code 
that would look like something that, uh, you know, a child was copying, it's kind of a bit rough, wouldn't execute at all. It's now gone to the fact that I actually just asked to do a simple regression analysis in R with a toy data set. It produced the right code. I copied that into R. It executed perfectly. I uh, did the same thing. I asked for a classification problem with support vector machine. It did the right thing, and it even imported the right library to use, E1071, for those of you who are into that sort of thing. So, um, and looking on Twitter, of course, there's some leading machine learning people on there saying, well, we put up um, defective code and it actually not only found the error, it explained why it was an error. So I decided to drop this bomb in right on this week where we're preparing HSE results. Um, the machines are churning over right now to make sure all the students are in a ward right now. And I said to, the, to the, uh, my colleagues, have a look at this. And so we started asking it to write HSC mathematics questions or business studies questions. And not only did GP, uh, chat GPT know that the high school certificate was Australian and curriculum based, it actually started to put up into the chat uh, very coherent questions and items. And even with the mathematics ones for mathematics advanced, uh, with the calculus questions it proposed, it even put the LaTeX markup in it. So it would render nicely in an exam paper. So it's, and the manager of examinations and testing at Nessa turned to me and said, so Andrew, does that mean for all the exam committees that come through, I have to check every single one of their items that they submit for, to compose the high school certificate questions to compare to see if this is what's being produced by chat GPT. So that I think is going to have profound uh, impact on high stakes assessment or even assessment with children, teenage kids, highly motivated teenage kids. I've deliberately not told my 13 year old son about ChatGPT, otherwise he'd be lost for hours um, and getting up to all sorts of nefarious things with it. Um, and uh, some other academic friends of mine on Twitter as well are going, well, how can we actually run external take home online assessments, particularly involving writing now. I actually think that things with G chat GPT and GPT-4, which is going to be more powerful than chat GPT by all accounts, it's probably going to render the external online, unvigilated, unsupervised examination uh, dead, dead, dead. I think in future, particularly if there's a high incentive to perform well on that test. So perhaps for elementary or primary school grade kids, probably not much of a threat. Maybe for some more mature adults doing an online MOOC or whatever, maybe not so much of a threat there. But certainly where you want to win a, a particular, uh, get a certificate or a uh, uh, entry to a university, a prestigious university or something like that. I think for those kinds of traditional assessment tasks, uh, I, I think having them online and unvigilated now or, or sending a homework task uh, to do at home, an essay at home online, forget it now, something that's reliable, at least in, in the next five to 10 years, at least or in the next five years. So that's how it's going to transform things. Uh, I even said to a colleague in the US who have known for 20 odd years, maybe it's time to go back and have exam sentence with pencil and paper based tests. Um, if it gets to that stage, <laughs> at least you know that uh, it could be the kids' own work. So uh, I think it's probably, uh, it's very difficult to see. I mean, I was so shocked by what ChatGPT could do. I'm still trying to actually get my head around the impact for, for online assessment. I think it could be absolutely and utterly profound. Yeah, no. Thanks so much, Andrew, for sharing that. And also, it's exciting to hear your thoughts as well about the implications of Chat GPT uh, on the high state assessments as well, and how you are actually thinking in an organization uh, uh, that is responsible for administering and creating these type of assessments. That that's really good. But obviously, lots of questions as well for us to think about what we need to assess. And uh, I want to turn it now to Catherine and uh, building on this line of. Um, discussion. And if we anticipate all these changes in assessment with the emergence of novel AI technologies, what kind of skill 
do we or skills we, do we need to assess and how do you envision the assessments of the future will look like? Do you have any thoughts to share, Catherine? Yes, I have a few. Thanks, Dragon. Um, and I, I have to agree with Andrew. I think that the emergence of AI technology that can basically both write and respond to questions certainly looks like it's heading towards some sort of student-free assessment process, which is vaguely terrifying, I think, for those of us who've worked in the field for a long time. Um, but the thing I think you asked about is what kind of skills do we need to assess? I think the push certainly that I've seen over the last five years probably is to move beyond what I'd call the classics, you know, the mathematics and writing and reading and science and history and all those sorts of classic academic skills. They're pushing towards something that doesn't have a good name, and Sandra probably has a better name for it than I do, on this transversal general capabilities 21st century skills class of things. And there's an extensive list of those, and critical and creative thinking are pretty commonly mentioned, teamwork, persistence, there's a whole set of those. And that seems to be the place where we're seeing a lot of push for development of assessments and understanding of how students perform. And it'd be interesting because I think people are hoping somehow that AI and assessment is going to break the classic iron triangle. And so things will be faster and cheaper and increase range and maintain quality. And I'm not sure we're there yet. Uh, the, my concern is that also in this space, we're sort of taking it for granted. Those things are valuable in the usual assessment sense of predicting something that we really care about, something we want to make an inference about. They're clearly valuable skills. Don't, there's any real question about that. But I don't know that they're valuable in that predictive sense. And I'm not sure we've established that. We seem to be sort of have moved past that question without really investigating it carefully. So do we really know that successful people, however you define successful, have more of those? Um, does possession of those skills correlate with progression or development or happiness or financial success or whatever it is you consider to make someone a successful person? Do, we don't really necessarily know that. We know that successful people have those skills, but we don't know if they have them differentially, I guess is the real question to me. And so I think assessment of those things, of course, is going to be quite challenging. It has proved to be so far. And one of the things that I'm finding in this discussion to be interesting, and I'm not sure AI has a place in it, but it's been a discussion in the assessment space, is that these skills are embedded in context and content, and, but somehow they're discussed frequently like they're going to be taught and assessed separately. Um, and I find that interesting because I think personally, I'm a pretty good critical thinker, for example, in things that are quantitative because that's my space and that's my training. I think I'm a pretty crap critical thinker in say art or history or things that I haven't studied. And I guess my question comes back to like, am I a good critical thinker or not? Because it depends on the context in which you're assessing my critical thinking skills. So I'm a little concerned that the tasks are likely to be complex. We may need a whole set of them in order to determine where you're strong in critical thinking or creative thinking or whatever it is. And it'd be great if the AI can develop these items and or mark them. But currently, at least, most people can't do it. It's quite a challenging thing. So even training an AI system to do this is likely to be something of a challenge. And we currently find regular assessments somewhat hard to construct to provide really high quality evidence. And so building these much more complex, much more memorable, much more expensive in many cases, assessment tasks is going to be a challenge that I'd really like to see AI help us with. So how do we build that? And how much harder are they to build for humans? How much harder are they to build for um, machines? And do they support the inferences that we would like to support? These tasks tend to be really memorable. They're expensive to create. And so we need a lot of them it, to, to cover all the content context and they're very memorable. You're gonna have to create ongoing, very large sets of assessment tasks in order to build these. And so I'm not sure we've gotten clear on that point. I think another place that AI could really help us, and I think Andrew mentioned this, is the idea of process data. So people solve a math problem or do a science lab or something of the sort and they're running a simulation or doing something else online and watching what their process is. We collect a lot of data on that, but I think our ability to assess that process data set for real value is still sort of developing. We're not crystal clear on it. And all of that leads me to a question around, I'm not sure AI has an answer for this one either, but how much burden are we imposing to build these kinds of evidential data sets to make an inference and on whom are we imposing the burdens? So I think there's a lot of things in there that we don't necessarily have answers to, and I'm not sure AI has answers to it, but I'd like to see us look at the tool sets for fairly practical things. So I think that, you know, 
one of the things Sandra mentioned that I agree with is the optimal way to do this, obviously, for AI systems is better to have a large data set. And so we'd like to see the assessments sort of embedded into regular classroom assessments and regular classroom activities and regular learning activities sort of invisibly. So it becomes a seamless process and that would allow you to build up a pretty substantial portfolio for a student over time in contrast to these sort of episodic assessments that we think of now. But that would require a pretty substantial change in classroom instructional practice, classroom equipment. You're going to run into problems with digital poverty. So I think the assessments of the future are going to look probably pretty different than what we have now in 10 or 20 years. But it's going to require some pretty substantial changes in instructional practice and classroom practice. And as Sandra mentioned, assessment can change more easily, I suspect, than education. Education is a very inertial system. It's big, it's complicated, and it doesn't move easily. So I think there are some pretty complex problems that maybe people are going to have to change their habits before we can really bring the power of AI to bear on the problems we have. Well, terrific. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine. That, that's really, really a excellent way of thinking about some of the changes that are happening. I just want to, before I move on to the questions that I have, uh, to some of to the second round, I would just want to ask other panelists if they wanted to respond to any of the thoughts so far that are shared uh, either by Sandra or Zach or Andrew or Catherine, or can we continue with the rest of the conversation? Yeah, I, I would so, I'd like to sort of um, take issue with Andrew's conclusion about um, what we should do in the face of all this amazing AI that's coming forward. And I think, Andrew, you said, well, we'll have to make sure we don't give uh, students unsupervised take-home assessments. It'll all have to be invigilated and perhaps with paper and pencil. And um, I can see that that is one way to tackle it. A another way would be to say, good heavens, that's what they're going to be doing all their lives from now on in. Let's let them do that sort of thing. But let's overlay that with um, other skills that they'll need to have so that they can manage that capacity, such as um, the, um, what transversal skills or 21st century skills or whatever. So it doesn't matter what area you're going to be in, you will eventually be able to use all of these AI things to generate a beautiful essay or solve a problem or whatever, but we're not going to want to relinquish that to the machine. We're going to want to make sure that the human side of it, the critical thinking, the communication, the fact that it's a social good, not just something that's happening, the community well-being, all of those kinds of things. And to me, they're the things that we should be focusing our assessment on now. We should be accepting that AI is going to be heading in that direction, albeit slowly in education, and focus on what other things we should be teaching to make the um, education stronger. So, Andrew, I guess the point is there are two, there's a fork in the road here, I think, and one fork is to go with the AI and, another, and um, sort of adapt with it. Another is to keep trying to um, stop it and keep doing the things that we've always done and testing the things we've always tested. So um, there you are. That, that was just a thought that popped into my mind as you said, you know, suggested what how we might respond to this. And I'll be interested to see how your organisation does respond. <laughs> No well, doubt. very, very, very slowly, as Catherine has said, because mm. there's an absolute ocean between what uh, the teaching community out there uh, know, understands about AI. I mean, I was at a, uh, a, a, a an event at the University of Sydney on automated essay scoring, and they, they it was a position paper. It was all very sociological, and there was a, a representative from the New South Wales Teachers Federation and I, she was up there thinking that, you know, uh, uh, being a, a digital Luddite, thinking that it was going to take all teachers' jobs and, and stuff like that. It was just so very, very old sort of schoolish, you know, Boomer Karen-ish sort of stuff. It was, um, it was, it, I had to basically, is the only one that stuck up my hand and actually said, well, 
look, I, I highly doubt this is actually going to happen at all. It's actually going to create uh, further demand. We're actually in a teacher shortage right now. I think there's actually going to be still shortages. Now, this is further to, in response to what you're saying, further to what Catherine uh, was mentioning as well. I think the uh, basis for a very good sound education is to have a knowledge and skills rich one. And AI will absolutely further demand that like you would not believe. I, in my view, um, I think that's going to be a greater demand for mastery and of areas such as linguistics to be able to test these large language models. There's certainly going to be greater demands upon to have mathematical knowledge or at least um, enough data literacy to be able to start analysing uh, data and to understand it and critiquing it and so forth. Uh, in order to understand what the strengths and limitations are of artificial intelligence. Uh, certainly in the scientific field, so you saw with um, DeepMind's AlphaFold, that would not have been possible without intensely knowledge-rich vein of research and a history of intense research into biochemistry and to protein structure. That those people who produce that research and knowledge wouldn't have been able to get there without having a knowledge and skill and intensive rich education. So I think it depends on what you want to really assess. If you want to make sure that someone has learnt enough of a relevant syllabus or curriculum, you're going to have to do that validly and you're going to probably have to do it along some sort of line of assessment that we're currently used to already. Those other skills that Catherine uh, that you've referred to, which Catherine sort of critiqued, and I'd sort of agree with this at her state at this stage, it's not entirely clear how predictive they are of success. I mean, can you be a critical thinker in a field in which you're an ignoramus? Maybe not. Maybe you could help identify certain uh, uh, you know, premises and conclusions that may or may not be correct. But uh, otherwise... How transferable are these 21st century skills? How predictive of they are they of life success? So they, these are sort of unexplored, un unanswered questions at this time. Now, where AI goes and takes us, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where it's going. I, I still haven't really got my head around where chat GPT or GPT-4 could really affect things. But I think once these tools, I, I guess it, it comes to the fact of when these tools get out there, um, and they become widely known. And somebody even remarked on Twitter today, it was like, this is the coming of the age of retail AI. Um, that, uh, if, yeah, I, I think our methods and, and approaches now of trying to actually get more assessment online or traditional assessment online might have to be rethought in a fundamental way, at least for when you have situations where um, there's an incentive uh, to try and cheat, and that is with um, uh, certification and high stakes examinations. Perfect. Th thanks so much, Andrew. I mean, th there's lots, I think, for many of us to unpack in the future to think about many of these issues. I want to turn quickly now to Zach, because uh, I think he also did some interesting work in the past and also is interested in doing that at the moment as well as with respect to much more authentic type of assessments as well. And Zach, you did some really interesting work on virtual in internships that are a form of immersive simulation-based learning. And so how do you see the role of AI in such type of environments that can potentially provide us with more authenticity in the assessment? Yeah, um, so I mean, I think one of the, one of the key findings of, from I think the learning sciences field over the last you know, 30 or 40 years is that authentic activities can be really good for learning, but at the, at the same time, uh, it's known that they're like notoriously difficult to assess and, and implement it at scale and uh, with a lot of the uh, things that we generally associate with assessments. And I think one of the reasons for that, uh, this is, I think Catherine basically hit the nail on the head, was talking about the differences in the kind of data that you have. So authentic tasks are not really amenable to the kinds of things you get from traditional assessments like multiple choice questions or answers or things like that, right? So instead you tend to get um, like interaction data is what I like to think of it as. So records of what people said or did, um, records of their process, it could be uh, transcripts, it could be video, it could be products that they've created, right? And so these are entirely different sets of evidence than 
uh, you typically deal with in, in an assessment situation. And so you have to use different kinds of methods to relate that evidence to the claims you want to make about learning or performance. And so I think that place is where AI can really help. Um, and so, you know, one obvious place is the, just the data capture, right? So um, automated text transcription, for example, um, by AI models is getting better and better, right? So you can actually <clears throat> get, uh, you know, say conversation data from, a, from an authentic task into machine readable format for analysis very easily or much more easily and accurately than you used to be able to. Um, the other piece of that is the actual analysis of the data. I think there are lots of AI tools out there or AI based models that are making uh, understanding process data easier and more valid and more aligned with the actual situation. So I'm thinking of things like uh, pattern mining, um, process modeling, um, network analysis, both social network analysis and um, uh, epistemic network analysis. Um, more complex models like neural networks, things like that are, are very kind of well suited to uh, provide insights in these situations where people are maybe working together, building off of one another, creating interesting things. Um, so, yeah. Th thanks so much, Zach. That, that's really cool. And I really look forward to seeing more of that work coming up in the future years as you are actually developing that research plan. And and I'm sure many people around the world as well are contemplating on uh, work on similar and related ideas. I want to turn a little bit more um, on the other issues that are related to the implications for uh, teaching, uh, practice, school policies, and everything else that is related to, uh, to the implications of the use of AI for assessment. So, Sandra, you work with many schools in your control, and I know you've worked with many schools and school systems over the years as well uh, as a psychometrician, as well as the leader in assessment. So what do you think uh, that, um, uh, you know, what kind of implications can you see that the introduction of AR for classroom practice and school policies we can see? And also how can schools and school systems get ready for the changes that AI brings? Hmm. Yeah, um, well, that's my whole life, working with schools and school systems to try and think through what are the implications, not, not only of AI, but, um, you know, climate change and wars and, you know, all of those things which are likely to really make uh, the life that people live very different and the need to be a lifelong learner really important. So that's what we spend our time doing. Um, I want to answer that, I want to just give you two examples of the kinds of pressures that the people we work with in schools and universities are responding to. Um, I worked with our accountancy profession a couple of years ago and um, my university produces accountants. Um, and what the accounting profession said was, Less of the, please, less of the things about which column you put the numbers in, less in the things about, um, you know, how to construct balance sheets, etc. All of that is online now. We can do all of that using hardly any accounting expertise. That's all handled now by um, artificial means. But we really want accountants. But what we want them to do is be able to work with teams of engineers or whoever they are. We want them to be able to communicate to all the people in the team. We want them to actually understand the business so that we can interpret which column the numbers are in for the business. So they're saying the kind of people you are generating from your university are really good on the accountancy skills. We don't need them. Our engineers can do that really easily. We want people who understand finance, who can collaborate, communicate, work with team uh, teams, I suppose, who are creative. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing in accountancy, is it? Creative accountants. But um, that, that's what they really want. Now, cut to another group of employers 
who are working with disadvantaged community in, in the southeast of Melbourne, um, where there's high unemployment, but employers can't get the people they think they want. Now, the employers are not saying to us, we've got a new hydroponics farm here that uses really top technology. We want expert hydroponics people. They're saying, we'll teach them the hydroponics. We just want to know that they have learned something to a degree of depth in, in an area, but that they, they have the skills to learn for themselves that they have the skills to, to work with a team as the team learns how to respond to everything in their business. And in the end, they're saying exactly the same thing as the accountants. Teach them how to deeply learn on their own. And in a way, it doesn't matter what the domain is. The hydroponics people were saying, you know, any science thing, if, if, they, if they love biology and they've gone really into it and they've learned how to learn, how to collaborate, how to cooperate, how to lean into a corporate sort of goal, they're the things we really want. Now, in all the people we work with, they say, we know how to test science. We know what depth in science looks like, but we don't know the rest. We don't know how to figure out for a person who's digging deep into science whether how to assess whether they're going to be also good collaborators, communicators and so forth. We now have a database of 300,000 assessments in the area of these generalizable skills and um, our um, premise and the data and evidence that we're showing is that these skills are transferable, they are accessible, they are useful, they are what employers want to see. What we haven't been able to find yet is the AI applications that can help us assess them. I am looking because I think we need to find them. So um, at the moment, I think the AI is helping us with the, as Zach said, with the traditional standard assessment paradigm. When it comes to assessing what students need to thrive in the future, it's not there yet. Um, and I, I, I just don't agree with uh, those people who say we don't have the evidence base to test them or know that they're useful. We don't need, we do, can't teach them separate from domain skills. We know they work. We know people want them. We know how to assess them. We've just got to get down and dirty and work out how to do it effectively. And that's what I'd like AI to take on. Yeah, th thanks so much, Sandra. That's really fascinating uh, response and lots of actually good ideas and ways to think about. I want to turn quickly to one of the questions that Andrew also um, asked or mentioned uh, with respect to the, you know, um, AI is going to replace the teachers, not necessarily replacing the teachers, but also something that came up in the paper that Zach initially mentioned. And uh, uh, I just want to uh, ask you, Catherine, to comment a little bit on uh, you seeing any potential trends that AI in assessments may sideline the sideline teacher professional expertise and practice. In the situation, for example, when you see that AI is doing lots of calculations and produces outputs and then, uh, and then these are basically deferred or automatically taken as correct. And so it could be easy then for educators to take their output of plagiarism uh, detectors as a correct decision rather than a tentative suggestion. So how do you see that um, we actually can make sure that the educators' uh, professional expertise will not be sidelined uh, with AI? I think it's an interesting question because there is a big fear. I mean, as you said, it seems to come up when these discussions happen and teachers are afraid that this is somehow going to take away their jobs or take away at least the interesting parts of their jobs. And I don't think that's the right framing. But it is a meaningful problem because it is a real emotional reaction. And fear in the teachers who are the target audience for use is exactly the wrong reaction for getting them to use all the technology that they can. 
So I think we need to reframe this in terms of understanding how teachers and AI can serve as partners. They have complementary skills. They don't replace each other, certainly not yet, at least in my opinion. Um, I mean, you mentioned plagiarism detection, and I find that interesting because in a, a previous life, um, well, I worked with the admittedly quite old at the time automated plagiarism detection system. And in a batch of about 100,000 responses, we typically get flags on 15 to 30,000 incidents where it had detected somewhere in its corpus someone else had written something that was shown up in one of the essays. And it got screened through a series of processes, including human beings, and typically about 30 of those were clear enough cases to actually act on, that the others were just, it's a common way of stating something. Or was just, you know, it was overly sensitive. Now, I know those systems can be tuned and I know they've improved dramatically in the period, but I just say, you know, a, a hit rate of sort of one in a thousand was not uncommon for us to say, yes, that is genuinely plagiarism versus it's just a garbage detection. So human judgment was still required to act reasonably in those cases. And I suspect, although it is probably more accurate than the, the one in a thousand, it's probably not below one in a hundred, certainly not below one in 10 in terms of tagging. So you're still going to need people to make judgments about reasonability because AI, as clever as it is, hasn't quite gotten there yet. And I think Sandra made this point, and it gets made pretty routinely. Students learn best from humans, at least at this point in our evolution. I can't tell you what we'll look like in 10,000 years, but at the moment, students like to form relationships. They need to feel that somebody cares about them, that they're safe, that they have personal interaction. And that is something an AI cannot replace, that, that it requires a human being, it requires a teacher. And so I think that is never going to be replaced. And it's worth emphasizing to the teachers who are, in fact, anxious about this, that what we're really looking, I think, in most cases is to have AI and automation optimally replace tasks that are tedious, repetitive, time-consuming, hard for humans. Human beings get tired, they get frustrated, and they make errors. AI doesn't get tired, which is one of its huge advantages. So if we let them, machines, of course, will replicate human errors, as anybody who's ever tra trained a chatbot or looked at a biased outcome set from training. If there are biases in the underlying training set, there will be biases in the AI. So that human judgment component certainly hasn't eliminated from the system of something that we desperately need in a lot of cases. Um, these systems are human creations, and we tend to sort of move past that and forget it, but I think it's worth reminding people. AI systems were built by people, and they still have some of the faults that people have. So judgment is going to be required. And I think so far what we've seen AI use in the classrooms were pretty minimal. Partly that adoption fear has been an issue, but I suspect it really is mostly the usual suspects. Teachers are very time poor, so they don't have time to learn how to use a tool that might be cool, but isn't necessarily well targeted to things they really want help with. So in terms of classroom instruction, you may get adoption of really useful technology eventually, but if it's added work for a teacher, they will avoid that like the plague. So I don't think anything that says a teacher has to spend a lot of time and effort learning it is going to see widespread adoption in the immediate future. So if you really want to see AI get in the classroom and be a support and be an aid for a teacher, you need to make sure the tools we're offering genuinely make teachers' lives easier and free up time for them to interact with and build relationships with their students. So if you make some tasks faster, make something go more easily for them. So if you could teach an AI system, say, to take attendance, teachers would love that and it'd be adopted immediately because it's a task that's tedious and hard and nobody wants to do. So part of it, I think, is going to be targeting the tools to the things that teachers would desperately love to unload. And once you get the system in place in the classrooms, you could probably expand uses from there. But your initial entry point has to be something that makes their lives better. Beautiful. Thanks, thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, I, I would like to turn now to some of the questions we have from the audience, because I think you partly also answered the last question that I had for Andrew. And I want to actually ask Andrew to perhaps uh, start with uh, a couple of questions that came up on Whova. One question that uh, Martin Dugiama asked is that getting somebody else to do your work was always an issue, whether it's an AI or a human brain. So what do, you, what do the panels think are the best other forms of assessment that are AI true? Um, so Andrew, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, AI proof. Well, uh, having been involved with the high school certificate, which is kind of uh, Australian equivalent to the SAT, uh, or more, I think it's more similar to the ACT that's curriculum based. 
Um, there's been very elaborate attempts at, at cheating um, with conventional technologies and very primitive technologies uh, in, uh, in the HSE, some more effective than, than others, and there are some very hilarious incidents where it's all gone wrong for the students concerned, actually. Um, uh, AI proof, I mean, it, it all depends upon what, what, what you want to get out of an assessment and what you're wanting to assess. Like, it is very, very critical that we have people who are clear and proficient writers who are skilled in writing and skilled at English. Because if you're skilled, at least in here in Australia or overseas in whatever language uh, that they they speak natively, uh, also perhaps English as a second language, given its uh, its ubiquity in science and uh, and business. However, you you really want to have that particular person genuinely improve at that skill and to be very highly skilled at that. And if you have a technology like AI that tries to undermine your attempts at assessing that by using GPT Playground or ChatGPT, then you're not getting a valid or reliable assessment. The teacher is not going to actually genuinely understand where that child is. I mean, to give an example, a positive example of that where uh, ChatGPT was used uh, to actually address a deficit in someone. I saw somebody on Twitter had actually made up an application for a friend of theirs who had suffered from language delay um, and that this continued on into adulthood and so started up his own uh, uh, lawn mowing business but couldn't actually respond uh, to uh, a client's emails very, very well at all. His written expression was extremely poor. And so this person had actually made up a, a chatbot which had actually uh, answered clients' emails in a very clear and articulate manner such that those clients were engaged more properly. I thought that was a very, very positive uh, application there to actually address a deficit. And that's possibly where we might be looking at AI is to actually help on people's skills in certain clinical and edu uh, sort of learning difficulty populations to actually, um, or kids that have simply fallen through the cracks and can't recover, where uh, it could actually assist them. But in terms of um, uh, trying to get a valid assessment that can inform instruction, in those relative core skills, um, I think we would have to find a way uh, to ensure that AI can't be used to distort those. And um, any sort of um, situation where it's possibly uh, not invigilated, not well supervised, um, and online, without lockdown browsers and so forth, all the technologies that we'd use to stop cheating, I think would um, undermine what we have considered and what a lot of Western society has um, prided itself on, and that is uh, a great education for a lot of students in the right skills and abilities to be able to make the most of their natural talents that they have. So I think it, AI does present a threat to uh, the validity of traditional assessments. And I know Sandra probably would say that a critical think, 20th century skill thinking can be used with AI and so forth, and it is predictive and this is what people want. But okay, I, I guess we'd want to see sort of the, the, the published uh, papers on that that prove that and survive peer review. But if you want to publish papers, what do you have to be? You have to be a pretty proficient, persuasive writer. And you have to have the scientific knowledge to be able to do that as well. So I hope that sort of answers the question. I really don't have a firm answer on, on what methods of assessment are going to have to be devised in order to ensure the validity of assessment and its, its usefulness in the classroom. I hope I haven't spoken too long now. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks so much, Andrew. That's a very thorough answer. To that, I want to try to perhaps ask the panelists now to have consider the following questions more like a quick fire question so that basically they also have very quick responses up to 30, 40 seconds. So Jason uh, Messon asked the question that he thought today reflected the supermarket, how quickly self-checkout has transformed grocery uh, purchasing. 
as a metaphor, what assessment practice might do a similar thing in education? Sandra, do you have any quick thoughts on this? Yep, self-assessment, I think, is going to be crucial in the future. And um, I think we should see more of it. And I think it's something that AI can help with to set, set the standards and equilibrate them. Um, yep, that's quick. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sandra. Uh, Kathleen, uh, you mentioned that you have also some prior experience in different types of systems that are used for plagiarism detection and cheating. And uh, Matthew Hiller asked a question to comment on the implications of AI on academic uh, assessment and integrity in terms of the tech prevent or adapt. Uh, I Any thoughts on that? I think Sandra had the right point. This is We're going to have to adapt. We don't have any choice. We're going to have to try and stay at least current with the tools. So I think we're going to have to change the way we assess so that the things we're assessing are not easily done by an AI system, but require human judgment or human processing in order to get meaningful assessments of the candidates. Beautiful. Uh, thank, thanks so much. Um, with respect to um, the question that Martin Bugiamas had, do you have any theoretical frameworks that explain how we assess our colleagues at work at, at conferences like this, for example? So in a way, recognizing more informal type of experiences that are happening in practice. Anybody has any quick thoughts on that? Look, I think micro-credentialing is just going berserk um, very usefully in a lot of ways. And if you can establish what clearly what it is you want to assess, you could um, use uh, developmental-based uh, progressions of skills or abilities that you want to observe in an environment like this, and uh, assessments could be devised. I mean, I, I think assessment can do anything you want it to. It's just that you've got to be careful about what you want. Perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Sandra. Ali Darishi here posts also a really interesting question with respect to the role of assessment that is not only for certification, but also for providing feedback on learners' performance on their assignments. And uh, and see basically that no problem in terms of using AI for their task is the part of their uh, if these type of feedback opportunities are also preparing them for the future opportunities as well that need to basically help them complete to the career duties. So he's basically just wondering, shouldn't we adjust our assessment processes to account for this? I'd say very quickly, yes. I think that basically is if you're talking about the use of these type of assessments as incorporating our teaching practice, and they are basically also serving part to also formative. Uh, nature. However, we need to kind of rethink the ways how we are also doing other types of assessments that are more standardized tests and high stakes tests, which I think we spend more time discussing about rather than thinking about the classroom practice and the use of low stakes uh, for, for the lack of a better word, uh, assessments. So I'm afraid that we are basically coming to the end of this session. Uh, we missed to basically uh, answer some really also very exciting questions live, but I'm going to encourage our panelists to consider answering some of these questions on Whova and also any other participants who are today with us as well to post or answer any of the questions uh, on Whova as well. I would, not like to, I would like to thank our panelists for their really exciting discussion. I always learn so much from these panels and I'm feeling kind of almost privilege to cheat basically to moderate these sessions to get all these cool thoughts from Sandra, Zach, Andrew, and Catherine. Also, thanks so much for the audience for really being engaged into this conversation today, posting many exciting questions and also live conversation as well about different issues that are related to assessment. I'm sure we are all going to meet soon to discuss other implications of AR for assessment. Thanks so much. And this is the end of the session.